Hi, and welcome to NASA's Digital Learning Network at the Johnson Space Center. My name is Patricia Moore, and I'm an education specialist here at the Johnson Space Center. And we have a really great program today for you that focuses on all of the International Space Station partners and the cultures, as well as their music. And the best part of our program is we may have a special guest stop by um, all the way from Earth orbit at uh, 240 miles above the Earth, a Commander Chris Hadfield. But first I'd like to show you everyone we have on the set today and all the folks that are part of our program. Our, our most special guests today are our 12 students from Carl Hall Elementary from Pasadena, Texas. Why don't you wave and say hello to everybody. Hi. Hi. Awesome. We are so glad to have all of you here today for our special music in space choir. And joining us as well is Jamie Leupold, who's an educator at Pearl Hall Elementary. So thanks, Jamie. Thank you. And also here today in our set, as part of our program, are two astronauts, astronaut Katie Coleman and astronaut Dan Burbank. So welcome. So uh, we have a great group of folks here today, and we're so glad everyone's here. So next, I'd like to highlight our two schools that are joining us live. Um, we'd like to begin with the Pearl Hall Elementary School in Pasadena, Texas. Why don't you guys unmute your microphone and say hello to everyone. Good afternoon from Pearl Hall. Everybody say hi. Hi. Welcome, Pearl Hall. So glad you guys could join us. And next, I'd like to go live to our school, uh, the Chris Hadfield School in Ontario, Canada. Why don't you guys uh, mute your microphone and say hello. Oop, it looks like we may have lost them, so we'll give them a chance in a little while to say hello when we do some question and answers. So I'm glad everybody's here with us today. Uh, we are going to get started by talking a little bit about the International Space Station, since that is our focus. So the International Space Station Project is a collaboration of many different countries. We have the United States, we have Russia, we have Japan, we have Canada, and we have many countries participating in the European Space Agency, as you can see on the map. Now, assembling the space station was no easy feat. We had to have 115 space launches on Soyuz rockets and on the space shuttle, and we conducted 162 spacewalks, um, which took over 1,000 hours. Now, the space station is the largest man-made object in space. It encompasses 32,000 cubic feet of living and working space, which is equivalent to a 747 jet, and it is also the length of an American football field, so it's huge. Now, the purpose of the International Space Station is to conduct scientific experiments in microgravity that's going to advance technology and science here on Earth, as well as it prepare us for future missions beyond Earth orbit. Now, there have been many astronauts uh, visiting the space station. It all started um, with our first crew in 2000, Expedition 1. And now we have three astronauts living on the International Space Station as well. And they will be visited by a whole other set of three astronauts in a few days, which will give us a total of six astronauts in space. So that's a look at what's happening right now with the International Space Station program. And I'd like to now uh, let Jamie tell you a little bit about the amazing things she's done at Pearl Hall Elementary and how she's uh, encompassed STEM education with music. Jamie? Thank you. We have a special program that was developed 12 years ago by the music team at our school, and it's called Building Cultural Bridges. With this program, we looked at the curriculum to see where were some areas where we could br better bring integrated curriculum together for students, and that really helped us to focus in on the cultural aspects of what we were doing regarding science and math and, and history and writing and reading. So we approached NASA and the Houston Symphony, the Houston Grand Opera, Society for the Performing Arts to see if we could get them to come out and help support the curriculum by bringing guests from the countries of the International Space Station program. Let children interview them, they learn their folk songs, they learn literature from their country, so they have a taste of what it's like to go out and what astronauts are doing now working with partners around the world and put this into a real life learning situation. So the children actually interview these guests and, and the astronauts who are participating in today's program have been at the school and have been interviewed by children. And so their songs we've learned and every kid kindergarten through fourth grade learns their music as well. And it's great to have the opportunities here today to share some of that music. And 
whenever we look at how does a song connect to curriculum in science or math, it could be a song about a science topic or it could be connecting us um, with simply our learning patterns. So music is a special way that we all learn and it allows us to better become a vessel for learning. It connects emotionally for kids, which helps the memory stay longer. And when kids are connected to any kind of learning emotionally, they have this incredible, complete experience that stays with them when they leave the classroom or when they leave Space Center Houston. And the experience stays with them, but so does the content. And so it, it provides for a deeper and more broad learning opportunity for the kids. And to take that and move that into astronauts worldwide and their cultures and what is being done academically. And what's being done academically for kids around the world, it just makes this very rich learning opportunity. And fortunately for us, we have administrators who support this kind of, of out-of-the-box learning and thinking, and it makes it not only fun for the kids to learn and memorable, but for the teachers as well. That's just such an amazing program. So thank you yes. for sharing that. And it sounds like our missing school just appeared. So the Chris Hadfield School in Ontario, Canada. Why don't you guys unmute your microphone and say hello to everybody? Hi, we're so glad you could join us today. All right. Okay, so that's great. So I'm glad we have everybody. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. Uh, we are going to focus on each of the partners of the International Space Station and highlight each of the countries and the culture. We're going to talk about their contributions to the International Space Station project, talk about um, how we're all working together and the special things that each country is doing, and then we're going to highlight each culture with a song by the students. So let's go ahead and begin with our first country, and we're going to begin with Japan. So we have uh, Japan, which is part of the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Katie is going to talk to us a little bit about their partnership with NASA. Well, my experience with it was training in, in Japan, learning some of the Japanese experiments, but then also living on the space station, the uh, a Japanese space agency has a whole module with a big stowage compartment on top, which we loved, and then a back porch. And what you're seeing right now is uh, two of our astronauts. And uh, let's see, that's uh, Naoko uh, Yamazaki and, uh, is that and Soichi. And so there's, uh, they're both in the Japanese experiment module. And you can see that it's really pretty big. It's a great place for us to store a lot of things, but it's a magical place for science. They have some equipment that we don't have other places there. They have a centrifuge. So and it's not a huge thing, it's actually kind of small, but there's a way that we can grow plants where we wonder, you know, what's going to happen with plants up in space? Because we want to have food on our way to Mars, and we're going to have to grow it, so we need to understand how to grow things up in space, but it teaches us lessons for how to grow things down here too. And that centrifuge allows us to take the same little plants and same little seeds and things and have some of them be weightless and some of them in the centrifuge feeling just as if they were on Earth, having one degree of gravity, a 1G atmosphere. So there's a, lots of really, there's a lot of really neat things that we can do there. I think we also have a, a picture that shows the, um, the Japanese experiment module from the outside. And you see that hanging off the end there? That is what I call the back porch. It's got a big, long name. But that is where we have other experiments. Many of them are telescopes. So here we have our space station in low Earth that orbit, and then we have telescopes up on that space station, and whenever we see something really exciting happening out in the universe, we can get every telescope looking at the same thing at the same time. And those telescopes are actually kind of different, all of them, so they give us a lot of information about stars exploding and galaxies colliding and black holes and all those things. So it's really a, a pretty neat place to, to do science. and. I think it's also a kind of a quiet place on the space station, and a lot of us like to go there to talk to our families because it's quiet. And I used to like to go there to play my flute. I think you guys have a video of something I did for just this time of year. And, uh, this is something you can only do on the space station, float around like that. I like to say that we fly from place to place up there. But that Irish flute is 150 years old, and it's a treasure of Ireland. 
So it's pretty neat to have it up there, have something so old be in a place that was so new and so modern. It was designed by kids like you when they grew up because they got the right amount of math and science. Happy St. Patrick's Day from space. <laughs> and one of my favorite places to be, Patricia, on the space station. Oh, that's beautiful. It's amazing. So, Jamie, why don't you introduce our first song we're going to sing? Okay. To honor our, our Japanese partners with the International Space Station program, we have prepared a song that was shared at our school by JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata. And was his, it's a traditional Japanese folk song called Usagi Usagi and was one of his favorite growing up, which translated means rabbit, rabbit. So here's Usagi Usagi. Absolutely beautiful, wonderful job. Great job. All right, so now we would like to highlight our next partner. Our next country we'd like to highlight is Russia, and Russia um, um, Space Agency is called the Russian Federal Space Agency, and we have been working with our Russian partners for many years. They're a very strong partner, um, and our, our kind of history goes all the way back till 1975 when we had the first international handshake in space during the Apollo-Soyuz test project. So very strong partnership. And Dan, why don't you tell us a little bit about everything that we've done with the Russians over the years? Okay, so early on in the, the space program, we and the, uh, and the Soviet Union were competitors. And, um, and we, uh, we basically uh, spent a lot of time uh, looking and studying each other's technology and learning how to do things, hopefully just a little bit better. We were in a race to get to the moon. We were in a race to do as many things in space as quickly as we could. And, uh, and we were both very, very um, ambitious competitors and very good competitors. I think if I look at it now, though, the things we do in space, we're really much better team members. And with the, with the beginning of the uh, International Space Station program, we've got uh, Russia is actually a key member in that. Uh, from a very, very literal physical system standpoint, um, the Russian modules on space station provide the ability for space station, provides the propulsive ability to keep space station in orbit. And, um, and it's, a, it's an entirely a very, very integrated uh, station. It's a very difficult thing. We have different approaches, I think, early on, the, the way that the space, uh, our space uh, programs developed a lot of the hardware. Um, but it was a, a real credit, I think, to the engineers on both sides that found ways to basically take hardware that had been built in entirely different parts of the, of the world and uh, integrate that and develop it and test it. In many cases, launch pieces on orbit that would never get a chance to actually physically be able to be attached to other pieces here on planet Earth and test it. And we essentially have built that together with them and the other partner uh, countries in the uh, International Space Station, essentially building an airplane in, in flight, if you will, as we've gone through. So it's been a, um, it's been a very good opportunity for us to learn uh, from each other how to do things. The Russian experience in space was, was very, very wealthy and very uh, strong in the area of long duration space flight. That's not something uh, that the American space program had. So building on the heritage of the Salyut program, building on the heritage of the Mir space station program, learning about how to operate uh, and keep crews healthy and safe in space long enough to potentially do missions long 
uh, far away from you know planet Earth. Uh, that was a key component for us. So early on, when the space station program was being developed, uh, we were able to partner with the Russians to fly space shuttles to the Mir space station to to figure out how to how a, a vehicle as big and complicated as as a space shuttle could work with the space station. And then ultimately, that enabled the space shuttle to do the thing that it was exquisitely well designed to do, and that is build ultimately a nearly million pound space station in orbit. So um, so right now we have a, a single space station manned and operated by all these countries all over the world and uh, we have a single space station crew and the crew is not just the crew that we have on board station, it's the thousands of people all around the world that keep it uh, keep it flying and safe and uh, and it's a, real, it's a real joy to actually be a part of that and to see what a strong partnership can really do. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the journey to the space station because we aren't using the space shuttles to go to the station. Absolutely. So it's a, it's, it's a very um, straightforward physical problem from, a, from an energy standpoint. <laughs> you need to go from zero to about 17,000 miles an hour to be in a stable orbit around uh, an, an 8,000 mile rock called planet Earth. So uh, it takes a lot of energy and the, the sensation that you feel right on now. the way uphill right, right now, now as the engine's light <laughs> Just as on, on a Soyuz is very similar to what you feel on a, on a space shuttle as well. And uh, it's quite a ride going uphill. And I mean, this was amazing. It's, it takes a lot of science and engineering for people to leave the planet safely. And there we are in my launch about two years ago. I'm, I'm waving, and we spent about two days in this tiny little capsule that is just as you know small as Dan and I sitting together plus one more person. And then we dock with the International Space Station, which is, I like to say it's about eight train cars all hooked together in different ways without the seats. So it's actually huge. And to go from that mm -hmm. tiny space where Dan and I would have to sit closer than we are right now to, to that really giant space and then live there for six months, I don't know about Dan, but I actually didn't really want to come home exactly <laughs> then. I would have stayed a little while. Yeah, I think Don Pettit puts it well. He says, if you could bring your family with you, there would be uh, perhaps no reason to even come back at all. You could live there forever. Exactly. It's pretty amazing. Wow. All right, so Jamie, we have a song to sing now. We so do. Why yes. don't you tell us a little bit about our next song? This is a traditional Russian folk song for our Building Cultural Bridges program was contributed by um, one of NASA's well-known engineers. It's Dr. Jack Bacon. He spent much time in Russia, specifically with the space program, and he shared and taught our students how to sing Kalinka. Mm -hmm. So our third partner we would like to highlight today is a, a space agency that has many countries that are a part of it, and it's called the European Space Agency, otherwise known as ESA. So Katie, you flew with an ESA astronaut, Paolo Nespoli, and he and you did some amazing experiments on the International Space Station. So why don't you tell us about some of the science? Well, one of the pictures of Paolo, I think, says it best. You see the Columbus module. And it is, Columbus is one of our international partners, so they've got one big, of, you know, one of these big train cars almost. It's that, it's that kind of size. And on the sides and on the ceiling and on the floor, we can use all that space and we fill it with experiments, plus a few other things that we'll talk about in a few minutes, which would be some things that we use for recreation, like fun, like musical instruments. But there's Paolo, and he's getting one of the experiments set right now. 
And a lot of the things that we do are medical experiments. We're trying to understand what happens to people up in space. Because when we go to Mars, we'd like to come back. And we'd like to be able to work there and do experiments there. So we need to understand what's going to happen to people, what happens to our hearts when they, are, they don't have to work so hard to pump blood all the way up to our head like they do down, down here on the Earth. So it's, um, we can do experiments with our hearts. We do a lot of interesting experiments finding out what happens to our bones and muscles up there. Because down here, all of you kids are walking around and every time you take a step like that, it is sending a message to your brain that says, hey, she needs those bones and muscles. So let's keep them strong. Well, in space, when I'm floating around, it doesn't happen that way. And so I have to exercise and I have to watch what I eat and it turns out that exercising certainly can keep us from losing our bones and muscles. And that helps us learn lessons for people up in space, for other people too, down here on the Earth. Um, some of the other experiments that we do, this is one of uh, our, uh, we're looking at actually Paolo's brain, understanding <laughs> what is it thinking when everything is floating around. Um, we also have experiments where we do crystal, we grow crystals. Because we don't have very much gravity, we can grow really perfect crystals up on the space station. And here you see on the one side is sort of the, I call it the ugly earth crystal. On the other side is a really perfect, beautiful crystal that we grew in space. These turn out to be crystals that are grown to design drugs to cure diseases. It's like fitting a, a key into a lock and we have to understand exactly what the lock looks like to make a perfect key. And so up in space with our more perfect crystals, we can design drugs. This one happens to be for muscular dystrophy. So we can, we've designed some drugs up there that are coming, that are beginning to work down here on Earth. And now let's see, what else do we have? I think we have a candle flame. This I love to see because you can see on the left that flame that's going big and tall. Well, that's because the candle burns, there's gases that are given off, those lighter gases like hot air balloons are rising. Well, up in space, Things, lighter things are not going to rise, are they? No. So we end up with candle flames that are shaped differently, and they're round. And it turns out that things happen kind of more slowly, and we can measure them more easily. So we can learn a lot about pollution. Measurements that we have to make in less than a second down here, like so fast, we can make over 30 or 40 seconds up in space. So we're learning about pollution, about how things burn, about energy conservation. And our last thing that I have to show you about science, because it is so cool, and yes, it means that we play with our food, is up in space with no gravity, we get to find out what do liquids really want to do. Down here, gravity controls them, but up there, take a look. Here is a wild water drop. I mean, that could be my orange juice that I squeezed out of my drink bag. Uh, there's uh, my friend Jean-Francois Clairvois. You can see the bubbles inside the water drop there we are getting to see some of the really tiny forces that control liquids. We're getting to see what they really want to do. And, and, th and this is a really cool picture of a water drop. You can see Jeff's face there. So understanding what liquids want to do, it means that we can understand everything down here about flow through a pipe. That means the pipes in my body, my, my blood vessels and things, or in a factory, everything that's made, we're going to understand better how to make those things. It's astounding and it's a lot of fun. It is, and it, it seems as though all the things that we're doing on the space station have such a great um, complement to help us understand things here on Earth. There's all sorts of spin-offs that you may not even realize um, that are there that are help us and make our lives better here on Earth. No question. Awesome. All right. Well, Jamie, why don't you introduce our next song? Next song, I think, is a beautiful song. It was shared by a Swedish trombonist who plays here in Houston with the Houston Symphony and the Ballet, Thomas Hulton, and this is Vem Consegla or who can sail. It speaks of Nordish fishermen leaving that part of, the, of Europe, coming across the Atlantic not knowing if they would return. Who can sail or vem can segla.
much. You guys are doing a great job. All right, so we have about 10 minutes before we are going to have a special guest join us. Um, a little bit less than 10 minutes. And so what I'd like to do is go to Pearl Hall Elementary. I'm going to let you guys ask a question of Katie and Dan while we are waiting for our special guests from the International Space Station to connect. So please unmute your microphone. I know this is impromptu, but please unmute your microphone. And why don't you guys ask a question, something you've always wanted to know, um, but not one of the questions you were going to ask Chris. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dial. Have you learned something new from an astronaut that did things differently in this country that was better than your way? If yes, what was it and from which country? Hmm. You learned something from another astronaut about... Well, I, I guess I can give you one example, and I think there's lots and lots of things that we've learned. And I think the question was, have we learned something from another astronaut from another country um, that helped our life in space, I think, uh, become better and uh, and I can give you an example from my first mission which was STS-106 um, this was in September of 2000 about 12 or almost 13 years ago and uh, we were bringing up uh, lots of cargo to activate the service module the first you know very very large module of the Russians uh, their contribution to the International Space Station and uh, we had two crewmates on there uh, that were Russian crewmates and one of them Yuri Malenchko had been the commander of the Mir space station years before and, um, and shortly, and a lot of times when, when spacecraft get into space, shortly after that happens, a lot of things that would end up on the floor down here that you would never see, sometimes as soon as the engines quit, can fly off the floor and just be floating in the air. And that, that's true for, for new um, modules, new spacecraft, for example, as well. So we launch them often, you know, unmanned, and um, they will dock to the space station. Totally we think they're completely clean, and they have been meticulously <laughs> cleaned before launch. But then often there'll be, you know, small particles, maybe a small metal shaving or something that's suspended in the air. And, uh, and shortly after we got to space station, I actually I think got a small piece of, uh, of uh, a metal shaving in my eye. And, uh, and that could have been a very big deal. And, uh, and we always worry about things like that. We, in fact, we work very hard to try to scrub the atmosphere. Uh, before we all go into modules, we try our best to get the airflow going and to get the fans and the filters working to, uh, to eliminate those kinds of things. But sometimes there might be a little eddy where something will be in there. And um, anyways, in this case here, it was, uh, it was kind of a big deal. We have special goggles on space station that we can uh, sometimes use to very, very carefully try to get particles out of your eye so it doesn't pre uh, present a problem. But Yuri had a much better idea, so something you do all the time. The yeah, exactly. And, and all you do is like the, the picture that, uh, that Katie talked about earlier with the video with a ball of water. Um, absent the force of gravity, the surface tension becomes a dominant force. Water very happily takes the shape of a sphere, a sphere and it'll float there in front of you. And so Yuri squirted um, a, a large ball of water and, be, and it uh, just floated in front of me and we floated my eye over to the ball of water. And, uh, and essentially this eye was underwater, everything else was fine, plenty of air to breathe, blink a couple times, wipe it out with a towel, and life was good, no issue. And that's the kind of thing, little things like that, that people who live in space a long, long time um, become very good at, very efficient at. Wow, that's really amazing. So we've got a few more minutes before we're going live to our commander on the International Space Station. So I'd like to go to the Chris Hadfield School in Canada. Why don't you guys unmute your microphone and ask us a question that you hadn't intended on asking Chris. My name is Haley, and my question is, when you're in space, in the International Space Station, and if there's people from all these different countries, what happens if you all don't speak the same language? Well, Haley, it's a great question. How would you speak to each other? Um, it's a great question, uh, because, and we did think of that ahead of time, and so all of the astronauts that live on the space station speak Russian. You know, to some degree, enough to have a conversation, especially about important things like safety. And all of the astronauts that live on the space station also speak English. And then there's some other languages as well. In fact, I flew with an Italian, 
And so we, you know, we know that we know some of those things. And, and actually, when we talk, I think most of us, if we're talking about something Russian, like if we're in the Russian part of the space station and we're working on some piece of equipment together, we'll probably talk in Russian. And if we're working on something American, we'll probably talk in English. Dan can correct me if uh, yeah. it's different for him. But what I think is kind of interesting is that if you asked us what language we were speaking, we probably actually wouldn't know. And I would swear, because it's just sort of, you just find a way to communicate. Nor with the people listening. Exactly. Sometimes. And I would say that even uh, I went up there speaking no Italian, and after six months, I will tell you that at least I understand a lot of Italian. <laughs> amazing. Thank you, guys. Oh, did it's you, actually one of the neatest <laughs> things about flying in space. You know, we, we speak Russian because we launch currently on, uh, on Soyuz spacecraft. And uh, in the Mission Control Center in Moscow, um, we speak Russian with them. We, all the procedures in the Soyuz are in Russian. Um, but generally, as a rule, most of the things that we do that are operational on board space station are, are in English. And, um, and it's one of the neater things about flying in space, learning other languages, learning cultures. And frankly, you know, I, I, I think orbital mechanics is pretty tough, but Russian grammar is a lot tougher, at least for my brain. Great. All right, so uh, maybe we'll have time for one more question and maybe a sh short answer. So we'll go back to Pearl Hall. Pearl Hall, why don't you unmute your microphone and ask a question of Katie and Dan? Hi, my name is Omar. How many robots are actually on the ISS and how do they help you the most? How many robots? How many ah, robots? robots? You know, oh that actually goodness. depends on how you define a robot. And that we have one that there's no kidding. He looks like, and happens to look like a he, um, a robot. And that is Robonaut, who is up there helping us learn how um, um, humans and robots can kind of work together. And which we need to know down here too on an assembly line when a robot is working next to a person. We want to understand how to do that together really efficiently. But in a way, a robot is anything that you can push a button somewhere else and have that thing do something. Remote, remotely, yeah. And uh, we've got experiments like that. Right. Um, our systems, because we want to spend our time on experiments, you know, that we, we're not running around turning, turning up and down the air conditioning. You know, there's systems that are running by themselves. They're all remotely commanded. But all of that takes some, some really good science and engineering to design. Thank you okay. so much. All right, so while we're waiting for Chris, um, maybe um, I'll ask a question for you guys. So while you guys are up on the International Space Station, what's your favorite thing to do when you have a little bit of free time? Because I know you don't have too much. Mm -hmm. You first. Me first. <laughs> um, well, it's going to be the same answer. I'm yeah. betting you yeah. that it's looking out the window. It is. It's, it is a very special window, too. The, the cupola, I think, is, is just spectacular. We've got a, a window that's essentially a 360-degree window on the world. It's, it's, it's like a bubble underneath. A bubble. You know, there's windows this station. way, and there's a window here. And you can see an entire continent spread out beneath you. And, uh, and, the, shuttle, and the station is flying along at five miles a second, and you, you're flying like Superman over the Himalayas, and, and it is absolutely breathtaking. We used to have just like windows that were round. And so like if I'm looking, and now I'm gonna, we're going to go over Hawaii, well, I mean, there's a huge ocean, and then there's little Hawaii. And so it's going to go by pretty fast, because we're going about five miles every second. So it's, almost, it's, it's hard to see things just whizzing by when you just have that round window that it's like things a picture are going frame, by, almost. like a picture frame, exactly. Yeah. And, and so the fact that we now have a three-dimensional window where I can look out, and I'm from Massachusetts, so I, I see Cape Cod has very distinctive architecture, and, and I can see Cape Cod, actually so is Dan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can see Cape Cod coming, and then we're there, and then it's going away, and all that happens in about a minute. And I, I feel like I've been there because I can kind of see it before and I can see it after. A big part of some of the science that we do on the space station is Earth imagery, and so I know you guys are trained on how to take really good pictures so scientists can use those images to study the Earth. Do you have an example of maybe something, a picture that you took um, that was really interesting, something you weren't expecting? Well, I was up there during the Japanese tsunami, and we didn't actually see the tsunami itself happen, but we certainly were aware of it, and then when we went over Japan after that, they actually used our photos from the space station to understand our photos at night showed how much power was still available on the islands of Japan uh, to people, and we could take pictures that showed them the flooding damage in a sort of very big picture way and also detailed when they zoomed in. 
Yeah, during our six months, we, we took nearly half a million pictures, so there's an awful lot and, and a lot of keepers in there. But there was one particular one that, that made probably the most, meant the most to me, and that was shortly before Christmas um, uh, last year, so uh, December of 2011. And, and we were getting ready to fly over Australia. The sun was about ready to come up, and then there was this bright flash of light that extended from the horizon about as far as you could see, 10 or 15 degrees or so before it disappeared behind the Japanese module. And it was a comet, a comet that no one expected to survive a close pass to the sun. And it was spectacular. It was our friend for, wow. Comet Lovejoy was our friend for like two weeks probably. We, we would see it almost uh, probably eight or 10 times a day and really breathtaking. It's amazing. Standing. All right, well, we're going to give our comm check another try. So, Commander Hadfield, do you read us here at the Digital Learning Network at Johnson Space Center? Commander Hadfield, do you Center read us? And uh, all of the students involved today, I have you loud and clear. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know you have a busy schedule, and I know you have lots to share. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the space station and the importance of science and music education? It's an amazing week on Space Station. Can, can you mute your microphone? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's an amazing week here on Space Station. We uh, Just two days ago, we used the big cannon arm, and we released a spaceship, the Dragon. And uh, just a few hours later, it came down and landed in the Pacific, and people were there to pick it up and put it on a ship and unload all the science equipment here from the Space Station, all of our... Uh, medical samples and a bunch of things we sent to Earth. And then tomorrow, a spaceship is going to come from Earth up to see us with three people on board. There's going to be um, Pavel and Sasha and uh, Chris Cassidy. The three of them are on a Soyuz that's coming up tomorrow. And they're going to launch, and six hours later, they'll be sitting in the pad, launch, and in six hours, they'll be here docked to the space station. So we've been cleaning up for one spaceship and now making the beds and cleaning up and getting ready for guests to come. And meanwhile, we've been running this huge laboratory of, uh, I don't know, about 100 experiments that are running, uh, all kinds of stuff on the outside, looking at the universe, studies in the body. Tom was doing stuff for the human body all day. Uh, so a huge mixture of science and experiments going on. And in the evenings, we play music. And Roman has been playing a harmonica and a guitar, and I've been playing guitar and singing. So it's, uh, it's life in a little tiny microcosm here on board the International Space Station. Great. Well, I hear that we have a special song that you would like to sing with our choir here. Would you like to do that now? Sure, that'd be great. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'll check back with you to make sure that you're ready. And then uh, I'll give, if you give me about a 10 count when you guys are ready, then I'll start playing and singing. But I have to mute um, so, that I, I, so that I only hear your voices back. Actually, if you have your microphones muted, that'll work fine. And then uh, we'll, I'll just play the whole song end to end, and hopefully it'll work for you. And then we can talk afterwards if that's okay. That sounds great. So we are ready to go. So you get set up and we will begin and follow your lead. Okay, super. I'll be, I'll be right ready. Just a second. So as Chris is getting ready, um, we'll just tell you a little bit about some of the instruments we have on board station. So music is a, a key part of a lot of our lives. We've, got, uh, we've had many flutes. Yeah, thanks to Katie <laughs> on board station. We have a guitar. Apparently, we may have two. I don't know. We do have a ukulele up there. Uh, we have a great keyboard. We have had a trumpet. Uh, harmonica, obviously. I'm trying to think what other we've had. Uh, didgeridoo. Ah, didgeridoo. didgeridoo. Yes, didgeridoo. we've actually you know, created or made our own even and, and uh, sort of improvised. Sometimes we had a real didgeridoo that was actually on, on board station as well. Recorder. And a tin whistle. Ah, My right. ferret brought a tin whistle up there, and I brought a tin whistle as well. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So that sounds like an important part of what you guys do. I don't think you, you can do. take the music away from people. Oh. Okay, I think I'm ready. Okay. So if, uh, if you guys can confirm to me that you're all set, then uh, I'll, I'll be ready to start. We are ready to go. Okay. All right, this is a song uh, that was written by my brother for my first space flight. The first time I flew in space when I went to the space station Mir. And uh, it talks about the line to the sky that a, a rocket ship makes called Big Smoke, the big line of smoke uh, that takes us to space. And uh, I'll try and get all the words right. If I change them, I did it on purpose. Here we go. <laughs> big 
slow standing in the morning. Big smoke pointed at the sky. Big smoke take away our sister. Lift her up and show us how to fly. Big smoke louder than the thunder. Big smoke taller than the storm. Big smoke rise above these troubles. What an amazing experience. I'd like to give you guys a round of applause. That was great. Uh, of course, of course. All right, so now, Chris, we have two live uh, schools that are connected. We've got Pearl Hall Elementary and the Chris Hadville School in Canada. And we'd like uh, to give them a chance to ask questions, if that's all right. All right, so Pearl Hall Elementary, you're up. I am ready. I will do my best. All right, great. Uh, Pearl Hall Elementary, you're up first. Please unmute your microphone and you can um, be ready to ask your first two questions. Hello, my name is Johnny. And mine is Gerardo. What has been or will be your favorite experiment to do in space? And have you done an experiment that the results may have surprised you? I'm sorry, can... I didn't understand the question very well. Can I get you to say it again? And say the, the part of the question really slowly and clearly, because our radios aren't very good on the space station, please. What has been or will be your favorite experiment to do in space? What has been your favorite experiment to do in space? And, and what... And have you done any experiment that the results may have surprised you? And have you done any experiments that the results surprised you? I think the most fun experiment that I've done in space was one that I did by that window right there. And it was for a Japanese artist. And he, uh, like a lot of Japanese artists and poets and thinkers, they, uh, they really love to see the moon reflected in water. And this poet and artist thought, well, now that we're leaving Earth, we won't see the moon reflected in water. Wouldn't it be interesting to see our Earth reflected in water? And he thought, well, how am I going to get them to reflect in water? And so he, he built sort of a cylinder, and it had floating balls of water in it and a camera, a video camera at one end. And he called it Blue Earth Gazing. And my job was to get the water in there and get it tumbling and spinning around and set up the video camera just when the Earth was at the right light and to see how the world would look sort of uh, reflected and refracted in, um, 
in the in the beautiful light of space and the sun and the moon. And uh, I really enjoyed setting that up. And it was kind of a blend of science and art. And and, uh, and it was really nice to get to know the uh, the person and the people involved. So I think that might have been my most fun experiment to do. Let's see, one that surprised me. Um, actually, this one that's right over here is a Canadian experiment. And what it's looking at is little tiny, tiny particles that you can, can't even see, uh, so small that they're not just like um, mini or micro, we call them nanoparticles because they're like they're a billionth of an inch and um, or a meter. And when you let them sit here with no gravity where things are floating around, they crystallize like they won't do on Earth. They form um, shapes and structures that are impossible to form on Earth. And I take this tiny little tube and I mix it with a magnet um, for 20 or 30 minutes till I'm sure it's perfectly mixed. And then we sit it perfectly still for weeks and you watch it over weeks, and the crystals, these tiny crystals grow, and if you shine a light just through it, it starts looking like, um, like beautiful stained glass. And we're learning about how these, these little tiny crystals form, and what, what the structure of the molecules are, and of the nanoparticles. And it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's amazing to me, it surprises me when I set it up and I come back in a week and I take pic flash pictures and you can see these incredible shapes that are only possible to do here on the space station. All right, Pearl Hall, what's your next question, please? Good afternoon, my name is Stephanie. Have you had any experiences in the International Space Station that had inspired you to write a song? That's, that's a, that was a really clearly spoken question. Thank you very much. Um, yes, actually, I was talking to a friend and, uh, and my friend and I were talking about what it was like to fly in space and they said, well, you know, sometimes you need to leave home in order to understand it better. And, and, and it's an old story, but, but it kind of it's really, um, really uh, visible to me when you leave home so much, when you actually leave the planet. And I started writing a song called um, Leaving Port, you know, like a ship sailing out to sea. And, and I'm about halfway through writing that song. And it's because of looking out the window here and seeing the whole world roll by and starting to think about all the people in the past that have left home and how in the future we're not just going to leave home, but we're going to leave Earth and try to think, think about that in a song. So yes, th this place inspires me to, to write and sing music. All right, we're going to go live to the Chris Hadfield School. Chris Hadfield School, please mute your microphone and ask your first two questions. Hi, my name is Abigail, and my question is... It looks like we lost our audio from the Chris Hadfield School. Can you, can you guys repeat one more time? All right, I'm going to ask the question this. So um, the folks at the Chris Hadfield School, they would like to know, since taking over as the first Canadian commander of the International Space Station, do you feel that you have been working harder? And how has it changed your job? Uh, everybody on the space station works hard. Dan and Katie can tell you that. And we work pretty much all the time. You know, there's always something going on. When you think you've got everything done, there's always a list of other things that you need to get done. And if you have a little spare time, you really want to do something for your family or your friends or your school or your country. So there's always stuff to do. Um, and so as a commander, it's not like you're busier. You just have to be busy at different things. And I've started thinking more about what are all the other crew members doing? What are we going to be doing tomorrow? What are we doing next week? Is this the right thing to be doing? Um, how can I help the crew be more successful? How do I take care of them? Who looks tired? Who looks uh, like they're uh, doing really well? And just start 
taking responsibility for everybody around me and not just being a good crew member. So I don't think I'm working harder. I'm just trying to do my job right and and, uh, and make sure that everything gets done by everybody during during the day. And I really like it. These are good people I'm here with, and I'm really happy to be able to command them and, and help lead them and help all of us be as successful as, as we could be while we're here. All right, Chris Hadfield School, let's see if your audio is working again. Why don't you ask your next question, please? Go ahead and ask your next question. Hello, my name is Eliana. And my question is, was it difficult to connect to Ed Robertson while you were working on your song for Music Monday? If so, why? How does it feel to know that so many kids will be singing your song? That's a good question. Um, first off, it feels great that so many people like that song. I've heard from thousands of people that like it. Uh, it's been translated into over 15 languages. Uh, including even uh, sign language. And uh, I really like the song. It's, it's fun. Ed's a really talented musician. And he took uh, what was kind of a, a very basic idea of mine and really turned it into a, a beautiful song that tells the story very well. And um, Ed and I had been working on basic ideas for it for about a year. And once I got to space, then we would send emails to each other. And once in a while, we talk sort of like you and I are talking today. And, uh, and then practice with the music and we would send demo tapes or demo recordings back and forth to each other. Um, he sent me a recording that he did with his family and I sent him recordings that I did up here and eventually we got it all together and made it work, including a, a student choir from, uh, from the Toronto area too. And I think it really came out nicely uh, on a lot of different reasons. One, because it's a pretty song. Two, because of all the people that it, that it brought together. And three, because it helps to tell the whole story of music and art and science and exploration all together. I'm, I'm really proud and happy to have worked with Ed Robertson and all those people on that song. Pearl Hall, you're up next. So please unmute your microphone and you can ask two questions. Hi, my name is Kanye. How do ISS crew members from different countries get to know each other before going to the space station? What happens when they don't get along? Yeah, that's a good question. How do we get to know each other and what happens if you don't get along? Well, we, um, we don't just go to space station. We, we train for years. I've been an astronaut, if you can believe it, for almost 21 years. I mean, I'm very old. 21 years I've been an astronaut. And in fact, one of the cosmonauts, a Russian astronaut who's coming here tomorrow, he and I first met each other 17 years ago. So we've known each other a long, long time. And the other one, Sasha Mazurkin, when I heard that we were going to be on a crew together, I immediately, uh, gosh, almost two years ago, started getting to know him. I phoned him, I emailed with him, I visited him when I was in Russia. When he came to Houston, I went to some of his classes, we invited him out socially, we all went to, to, to go eat food together, to, to get to know each other. And uh, the, the Americans that I'm flying with, same thing. As a commander, I really felt it important that we weren't strangers when we got here, because if things go right, it's easy, but if things go wrong, if there's troubles, then you really want to know each other and be able to trust each other. And trust doesn't happen overnight. So, so I worked on it for the last several years. And then the last part of if we don't get along, we, we work hard to get along. We choose astronauts who are good at getting along. And then you train together for years. And so if you can get together, I'm sorry, if you can get along while you're training together for years, then you're probably going to be able to get along together in space. And then finally, as the commander up here and as a crew member, you really want to work every day on everybody getting along. You want to make sure that what you're doing is good for the other people. Be nice to them. Try and do something nice at least once for everybody else every, every, once every day. And, and we do. We get along just great. It's, it's, uh, it's closer than a family. All right, Pearl Hall, what's your next question, please? What has 
What's been louder? Hi, my name is Melanie. What has been the most your most interesting and favorite tweets you have received from your followers on Twitter, and why? Yeah, you know, people are interested in Twitter. For me, it's just exactly the same as what we're doing here. It's a way to communicate thoughts. And, and, and I'm really interested to hear what you're thinking. You know, everybody you ever meet knows something that you don't know. Everybody. Even if you talk to a, a three-year-old, they know something that you don't know. And the fun part of life is getting to find out things that other people know that you don't or the way they see the world. And Twitter is just another way to communicate. And and it's from beautiful thing, the beautiful thing about it is from Space Station, for me, it's a way to help communicate very easily and quickly what's going on up here. And I think it's really worked because, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people are interested in what's going on in the Space Station, and they can feel involved every single day. They can see what we're seeing. Um, the favorite, I don't know. I think my favorite is when people, they, they get on Twitter just to see what we're doing. And that happens every day. Every day there'll be a note from someone that says, hi, this is my very first tweet ever, and I only got on Twitter so that I could see what you're doing on Space Station. You can almost hear that they're a little bit nervous when they're typing their very first tweet, but they're also a little bit excited about seeing something new. And that feeling of nervousness and excitement of seeing something new is, is what this is all about. And so I just see this as a, a, a new technological way to communicate what's happening, and I love it that so many people are interested as a result. All right, the Chris Hadfield School, we have time for two more questions from you, and then we're going to let um, Chris tell us, uh, give us some parting words. Hi, my name is Ganya, and, and my question is, when a crew member from a different culture is celebrating a holiday, do you celebrate it on board the ISS? If so, can you please give us an example? Yes, we have crew members from... Uh, uh, in the space station program from 15 or 16 different countries countries and inside every country of course there's lots of cultures and languages um, well, just like in in uh, Texas where uh, those students are at Pearl Hall and in Milton where the students are at Chris Hadfield Public you all know there are so many different languages and cultures in your home or in the school and it's the same on the space station as an example Let's see, we have, right now, we have Canadian, American, and Russians on board. And we did have different holidays. For example, Christmas, for me, is on the 25th of December. Christmas, for the Russians, is on the Orthodox calendar. So it's, depending on the, on the calendar, it's, it's like the first week of January. And so we celebrated our own days that are special to us, really at the highest level, personally, for us. But then all the other members of the crew joined in. It's just like you, you would think it should be. We honor each other's traditions. We honor each other's beliefs and each other's cultures and histories. We try and learn and speak parts of each other's languages. And I've studied and learned Russian. The Russians have studied and learned English. And, and we study other languages as well. And languages just let you help to understand other people a little bit better. So yeah, it's really important to respect where people are from, the things that they value, and especially the, uh, the holidays and the days of the year that are important to them. Yes. So, hi Commander Hadfield, my name is Zion, and my question is, have there been any other instruments in space other than your guitar? If so, what were they? Uh, yes, in fact, when I was on the space station Mir, I was thinking, what would be a good gift to bring? Let's imagine that you were going to visit people on a space station, and you didn't just want to bring, you know, a certificate or something. You wanted to bring a nice gift. Well, I thought there, were, there was kind of an old guitar, but not nearly as nice as this one up on Mir. And I thought, what if I brought them a nice new guitar? And so I had a guitar specially built, and I brought it up to the Mir space station. 
And uh, that guitar stayed on Mir for 22,000 orbits of the world and is now in a museum in Ottawa. And on this space station, there are, there are lots of musical instruments. Uh, Katie Coleman, who's talking with us today, she brought flutes up of different types and tin whistles. There's a ukulele hanging just out there, well, hanging, floating just out there in the hall. Up above me up here in the Japanese module is a keyboard. And down inside the Japanese module, there's a bell, uh, a big bell that when you rub the edge of, edge of it, it, it hums, sort of like if you rub the top of a glass and get it to resonate. This bell you can rub, and you can get this whole big brass bell humming and vibrating, and it's a beautiful, uh, eerie sound to have re resonating and echoing through the space station. Music is really important to people. Uh, it's, it's very basic to humanity, and music, when people are in space, music is just as important to us here off the Earth also. Thank you, students, for those amazing questions, and thanks for answering the questions, Chris. Do you have any parting words you'd like to share with the students before we say goodbye? Well, first, uh, thank you very much for joining in today. Uh, I've been to both schools many times. It's a huge honor for me to be part of the school programs there. And remember to thank your teachers and the people who organize this after we get off. Remember to thank them. Um, just one thing, and that is just remember, you are gonna, you're going to grow up to be something. You're going to grow up to be something. And the key is, are you just, just going to let life decide sort of randomly what you're going to grow up to? Or are you going to try and help decide what you're going to grow up to be? And you can really shape that decision. The books you read, the food you eat, how much you exercise, what you do tonight, what you do tomorrow, you are the result of each one of those decisions. So think about what you might want to do in your life, and every single day, start turning yourself into that person. And that's what Dan Burbank did, that's what Katie Coleman did, that's what I did. And no matter what you might dream of doing sometime in your life, you can turn yourself, I mean, you may not get all the way to be exactly what you think, but if you start moving yourself in a direction you dream of and you like, and that really appeals to you, it's amazing where life can lead, and you're gonna enjoy every single step along the way. Thanks for joining in today. Good luck to everybody, and I'll see you when I get back on Earth. Goodbye, Chris, and thanks, um, and goodbye from the Digital Learning Network, the Chris Hadfield School, and Pearl Hall. Let's say goodbye. What an amazing experience for us all to have a downlink from the International Space Station. That was so cool. So we have highlighted each of our uh, countries that are participating on the International Space Station. And we have one left. Uh, we're going to highlight the United States. And the United States Space Program is called NASA, which stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I better get that one right, right? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Dan talk a little bit about NASA and our contributions to the Space Station Program. OK. Um, getting to be a part of this magnificent space program for the, for the years that I've been able to be here has uh, been basically a dream, something that I could not have imagined when I was as young as these kids here. And I certainly probably couldn't even imagine it when I was a pilot and an engineer early on. Um, the fact that human beings can do the things that we do, the fact that we can build spaceships that can take people to places like the International Space Station and allow that to be something that will uh, that'll pave the way for us to go to the moon, to stay, to go on to Mars, to go to asteroids. Um, that is just, to me, an amazing and, uh, and really uplifting thing. And it's human beings who make all that possible. And to be tied to the, the space program of this country, this great country that, that did so much throughout the history of the space program is really also means an awful lot to me. Um, space Station is remarkably intricate. It takes just going outside to really get an impression of that. And uh, when Anton and Anatoly did a spacewalk, or Anton and Oleg did a spacewalk during my mission, and uh, the thing that they took when they came back in was that from the inside of the space station, like Katie was talking, they're, they're fairly small modules, individual modules. You see the world of that module. Maybe you float down the cupola and you can see 2,000 miles in all different directions, but you don't see all the complicated machinery, all the, the incredible systems that make uh, living in space possible and to get outside and actually see that is just absolutely is breathtaking. Well, and 
No, I, I like to emphasize how that all happens. Like, you know, Dan talked about how he felt lucky and privileged to be a part of this amazing endeavor. And you might think that people like Dan and I, you know, we were born and we always kind of knew that we would get to do such an amazing job. And it's just not true. Regular people get these jobs and regular people design amazing space stations and amazing and, and the ways that we're allowed to live, live in space because they're doing what you're doing right now. They start at the beginning and they make sure that they are collecting all the tools that they might need along the road to do whatever they decide to do. And you probably don't know what you want to do right now and you're not supposed to. But you are supposed to be collecting tools, what you're doing right now. You're finding out about things. You're asking questions. The basic things like math and science and some engineering and also just writing in your own language, reading in your own language. Those things are so important because otherwise you can't communicate the cool things that you've invented. So I just like to emphasize that when we see this amazing space station the size of a football field out in space and you meet people who've lived there and we talk with Chris who's still living there and you realize that we're all human, realize that we have a lot of cool things that are left to do and that you could be one of the people doing that, doing those things, if you make sure that you're collecting the tools you need along the way. Yeah, and about the cool things we're, we're left to do. You know, we retired the space shuttle a little bit ago, and uh, the space shuttle got to do what it was really well designed to do, and that is to build the space station. Um, but that has allowed NASA right now to turn its sights on deeper space destinations, to be able to, to leave the orbit of Earth, to be able to go to the moon on a permanent basis. So right now, all across this country, there are companies building spacecraft that will be able to get astronauts to and from space station on a regular basis. For all of us as human beings, that, that helps us. That gives us redundancy. So we have many ways to get to space. And at the same time, NASA is designing a heavy lift vehicle that can leave uh, Earth uh, far behind and go to, uh, to the distant destinations that we really dream about. When I was eight and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were on the moon, I imagine that by now there would be thousands of people living in space, living on the moon in lunar habitats and, uh, and probably already on Mars by now. It turns out space flight's a little harder than that, at least a little harder than what an eight-year-old could imagine. But now when I look at it and I look at the kids that are here right now, I think by the time that they grow up to be our age, those thousands of people will be living in space all the time. And this will just be one other planet, Earth, that is the home for our species. And the plan happens, you know, step by step. And right now the step is to live on the space station, learn about how people can live up in space, and, and come back you know, healthy and, and understand what it's like to live up there. That's what we're using that space station for. And these new commercial companies that are building supply ships. I mean, the business of getting people and stuff up and down to the space station, we actually know how to do that. And that's why our commercial partners are helping us do that. But going further, there's some big lessons that we need to learn. We're learning them on our space station and we're building a capsule right now, the Orion that you saw a picture of a few minutes ago. The Orion capsule is what would take us further than low Earth orbit. To go to the moon, that's about three days away. That's where I'd like to actually go and learn a bunch of things before we go someplace like Mars, which now we're talking months and years in terms of the length of missions. So we're doing all the right things and right now our step is the space station. And your step is making sure that you've got all these tools like math and science and reading and writing that you can come and do these things with us. Well, why don't you guys share a little bit about our next song that we're going to be singing. Okay, so, so we've sung a lot of uh, folk songs from, uh, from all around the world and it's all part of our uh, collective heritage. And, uh, and so we're going to do a song here that's an old folk song. Um, 150 or so years old in the United States and I think at one point it was kind of the theme song of the 49ers that would head out uh, west to, uh, to blaze trails and, uh, and uh, this is a song called O oh Suzanne and the version uh, we'll play is a version that, uh, that James Taylor uh, played on, on one of his early albums back then. But, uh, so with and that. I think the chorus, you know, the chorus is something that it, the schools, you know, y'all will probably know the chorus as well and you should just feel free to join in. Okay. Well, I come from Alabama with his banjo on my knee, and I'm bound for Louisiana. 
my own true love for to see. It did rain all night the day I left. The weather was bone dry. The sun was so hot I froze myself. Susanna, don't you go on and cry. I said, oh, Susanna, now don't you cry for me. Cause I come from Alabama with his banjo on my knee. Well, I had myself a dream the other night when everything was still. I dreamed that I saw my girl Suzanne, she was coming around the hill. The buckwheat cake was in her mouth, a tear was in her eye. I said that I come from Dixieland, Susanna, don't you go on and cry. I said, oh, Susanna, now don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama with this banjo on my Thank you guys so much. We have highlighted all of our countries within the International Space Station. We've sung songs that feature each of the cultures, and we had a downlink with Chris Hatfield on the space station. So it's been a very, very impressive and exciting program for all of us, and I hope you all have enjoyed it. Now, in closing, as you can imagine, when we're putting together a program like this, there are so many people that helped us make this happen. So I have several people I want to thank, so just bear with me. But I want to begin by thanking everybody that's on the set, starting with astronaut Katie Coleman and astronaut Dan Burbank. Thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks and for having us. I'd like to thank our amazing choir, who deserves a round of applause for sure. All of our students from Pearl Hall Elementary, Pasadena Independent School District. I know all of your family and friends, and your district is so proud of everything that you've done. Now, there are several educators I'd like to uh, thank from Pearl Hall and also from the Chris Hadfield School. First, I'd like to thank Jamie Leupold. She did a lot of work organizing all of the kids. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And there's some folks behind the scenes that you can't see from Pearl Hall. We have our choir director, Pat Surface, so thank you. And then uh, thank you, let's see, who else do I have? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Seth, Seth, Seth Fuel at the Pearl Hall Elementary School who's helping us organize the video conference on the site. Now, at the Chris Hadfield School, I'd like to thank, make sure I'm going down. All right, I'd like to thank, I'm at MC. Christine Noonan. Oh, Christina Noonan and Principal Sean Marks. So thank you both, everybody. I see the Chris Hadfield School is giving them a big round of applause. And to all the viewers on the DL Info channel, as well as both of the sites, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd like to say goodbye um, to all of you from the Digital Learning Network at the Johnson Space Center. So thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.